So greetings everyone here joining today. Hope you are having a nice World Mental Health Day and welcome to the expert panel on the mental health of the intersex people. Uh, saying it's Spanish, saludos, bienvenidos al panel de expertos sobre la salud mental de las personas intersex. Uh, el panel se celebra en inglés y español con interpretación simultánea. So, uh, en la parte inferior de la pantalla hay la imagen de un globo y podrá seleccionar su idioma preferido. Uh, so, uh, also, if you have any technical difficulties, get in touch with us in the chat. And I want to thank the audience for joining. The, um, there's time reserved for a questions and answers. Uh, also, I invite you to submit questions and comments in the chat. So I'm thankful uh, um, to all of you joining today. And I am really grateful for all, from all my heart for the exceptional opportunity to bring together here today researchers conducting timely, reliable, and disaggregated res researches studying uh, regarding the mental health of the intersex people and to all I already thank in advance for their willingness, willingness to accept the invitation. Well, this expert panel on the mental health of intersex people is a joint collaboration between GATE and Yuga World. So I want to introduce Ellie Rubansk, intersex consultant working with Yuga. Uh, Ellie is representing Yuga World today and chairing this panel. So Ellie, please, Welcome, thank you so much for joining us today. Kia ora, everyone. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. You know, this day, uh, World Day for Mental Health is an important day. And before I start, I would like to thank also Gate for organizing the concept of this commemoration and for platforming intersex civil society experiences. I also want to thank uh, the fantastic speakers uh, for your time and for your tireless work helping in advancing the human rights of intersex people. And also my colleagues of ILGA for their support and to all of attendees for being with us in this webinar. Trigger warnings, I uh, would like to advise that some of the content in this session may be emotionally challenging and some of the topics can be potentially triggering. If you have strategies or coping mechanisms, we advise to put them in practice. However, we recommend you to stay in contact with the support team of GATE if you need further support. Regarding privacy, please bear in mind that this event is gonna be recorded, edited, and displayed at GATE's in ILGA's media channel. So if you have concerns with your privacy, we avoid you to avoid displaying your name or other personal details. As my uh, colleague Vida has said, there is interpreting. So you just need to click on the globe. If you speak Spanish, si tú hablas español, en el circulito donde dice eh, interpreting, en un globito, ahí puedes poder acceder al, a la traducción en simultáneo en el idioma en español. So today, we live in a world in turmoil, wars, an ongoing pandemic, an economic and financial crisis, and more dynamics that have a direct toll on the mental health of all people. The overall of today's world mental health is to raise the awareness on the mental health issues around the world and to mobilize the efforts and support the mental health. This day provides a great opportunity for all stakeholders today in the intersex civil society working on mental health issues to talk about their work and what needs to be done to improve the mental health of intersex people worldwide. We live in a world that people call this is the new normal, but what is the new normal? I wonder what is actually the old normal because for intersex people, since we are born, we are welcomed with scalpels and harm. In our innocence, we learn that mutilations, medical abuse, coercion, pain, lies, abandonment, rejection and discrimination, and even mercy killings are normal. Genital and gonadal mutilations, forced virilizing and feminizing hormones interventions, the rejection of our families, the ongoing and dehumanizing, dehumanizing medical abuse, the abandonment, the rejection of society, and is our ongoing of the universal reality. That is our new and all normal. Our bodies were have been ideological battlefields, but that's what does make a woman, what does make a man. Can a body be constructed, de deconstructed to feed a notion of normality? 
why a perception of normality or the social anxiety that relies on our bodies motivates that harm. Infant bodies that are completely unaware of the reality they have. Why society rests calm with these widespread mutilations continue happening. Why medical abuse is not investigated as an act of criminal, as a criminal act or as an act of elimination selectively at tar in targeting a population often mirroring genocidal acts that continue to eliminate us out of existence. Intersex people live with the long-term consequences of this harm for their lifetimes. We have visible scars, but often the most painful ones are the invisible scars. The injuries in our souls and minds or the injuries produced by rejection or the frenetic need to deconstruct and construct our bodies. For those that are not familiar with the term intersex, Intersex people are born with variations of sexual anatomy, genitalia, sex hormone produces organs, genetic makeup, and or secondary sex characteristics that go beyond the biomedical and social models of expectations for male or female bodies. Although intersex children may face various problems apart from infanticides, one of the most pressing issues for intersex people in that continue to be a problem is the intersex genital mutilations, representing a distinct and unique complex cluster of multiple violations of the most fundamental human rights. The rights to be whole, the rights to have our bodily integrity respected, the right to be free from torture, from mutilation, the right to have autonomy of our bodies, our privacy, the right to, to be free from medicalized harm. All forms of medical, uh, and abuse in clinical settings, the right to be free, the right to have a family, the right to have a control for our destiny, our future, our integrity, and our autonomy. Intersex genetic mutilations are all those practices where non concession medically unnecessary, non vital, irreversible cosmetic surgeries are performed in a harmful medical settings. And they are fundamented or carry on based on tragedies and social expectations for the medical, for our expectations and understandings of our bodies or force aesthetical understandings of normalization of natural human diversity. Today across the, the world are widespread and they are prescribed as a part of being, you know, intersex. Every single intersex person shares this pain. IGM practices have severe physical consequences, but what we're talking today are the mental pain and suffering and all the impact that this, or this, that this harm has on our minds, the scars that live uh, in our construction of our identities. Testimonies have documented the negative impacts of these irreversible uh, surgeries such as, such as those ones that include severe psychological suffering, depression, and the shame and secrecy that are associated with the attempts of hide and erase our bodily diversity. We're gonna to have today Adeline Berry, who's a researcher and who's gonna share with us the work, the interdisciplinary new, um, the intersex new interdisciplinary approaches, which is a collective effort to, co to collaboratively develop knowledge that will inform policy making and practice across the range of key sectors impacting in the life of intersex people. Adeline will provide us with an overview of the work in this field, as well as the reflections on the mental health of intersex elderly and intersex people. On the other hand, the COVID-19 pandemic is now in the third year, and it continues to pose a global risk in mental health. According to several evaluations by intersex civil society, the psychologically distressing nature of COVID-19 has been linked with reduced well-being and increased stress and anxiety. For a community that has already experienced significant mental health challenges, the pandemic worsened uh, in unimaginable levels the situation of intersex people. The impact of the pandemic is not experienced equally. That's why we're going to have the food experience of Irene Kusumko, who's going to be sharing us with us the experiences on the research they did on 2020-2021 and, and the ongoing research that they're doing on the impact of COVID-19 in Europe and Central Asia. Haikyu Chu, who is from Intersex Asia, is also going to show us the reflection of making the invisible uh, invisibility amplified which is a study mirroring the work of OI Europe uh, where they ma make an assessment of the situation of intersex people and the impact of the pandemic in Asia. 
Dr. Catherine Dawkins focuses on the mental health of LGBT and intersex people, and as the director of the Office for Culturally Responsive, Responsive Healthcare Education, Dr. Catherine Dalke works with educators and learners through the College of Medicine to develop longitudinal integrated curricula focusing in cultural competency and cultural humility. With the aim of preparing learners to care for diverse groups of patients, Dr. Dalke is going to take us through the first study that describes the physical and mental health experiences of intersex adults in the United States. Now we'd like to welcome to the room my dear Adeline Berry, who's going to present us the INA, the INEA research, and is going to share us a bit of their work in the fields of mental health. I pass it on to you, Adeline. Thank you so much, Ali, for that introduction. Also, thank you so much, Gate and Ilga World, for, for having me here today and including me with these, with my heroes. Thank you so, so much. So, um, I am part of INYA, as Ali mentioned. Uh, INYA is an international research network of researchers across a number of countries and a number of universities. Uh, I myself, I'm, I'm in the UK in Huddersfield, but there's uh, at the University of Huddersfield, see, I'm wearing the, the logo on the shirt. Um, and there's also work being done as part of INYA in, in a, Brussels, Dublin, Zurich, Barcelona, and Andalusia. Uh, you can find out more about INYA on the website, which is intersexnew, one word, intersexnew.co.uk. So the goal of INYA is to develop new knowledge uh, to inform policymaking uh, and practice across a, a range of sectors, uh, such as uh, multidisciplinary teams, research ethics, and intersex studies, social policy, activism, education. Um, INYA, I, I'll get in trouble if I don't mention this, but INYA is uh, funded by the European Commission's Maurice Klodowska Curé Actions Program. And also anything I say today reflects only on my own views and the agency is not responsible for anything that comes out of my mouth. Oh, thank you for putting it in the chat. So uh, I am myself an intersex person and the person that led me to this place as a researcher in this area is being an intersex person and my struggles to get care. Um, a study, a pretty recent study from the US 2020, Rosen, Rosenwald Mack et al, 2020, uh, found that out of a pretty large sample, almost one third of the participants had uh, attempted suicide. And that's a lot compared to the general population. The general population is like 0.3. And that studies that take in the numbers of the entire general population would also include intersex people. So that's a lot. And, and makes me wonder about all of the people who didn't get to be included in that study because they had actually committed suicide. And that, that's a very high rate. I mean, if we on one hand are being told that these, these surgeries are being performed and hormonal interventions are being performed to guarantee better outcomes for us, why are our rates of suicide and attempted suicide so damn high? Uh, like I said, uh, it was my search for help and care that led me to where I am now, researching uh, the experiences and needs of older intersex people from across Europe. Uh, I finished my field work and in, through all of my interviews, uh, very high amounts of depression, anxiety. Um, I'm still working out where it's higher, why it's higher with some people, why some people suffer from worse depression and that will all come out in my outputs. But like, like I said, we're told that these surgeries are, are purported to facilitate family acceptance, normal childhoods, except that's not really how it's working out. Uh, what I'm finding in my research and from interviews with, uh, I've interviewed 21 people across a wide number of European countries, a lot of estrangement from families, uh, otherness, um, feelings of abandonment, uh, especially when the, these uh, surgeries, J John Money, if, if people don't know who John Money is, he's the person whose theories essentially industrialized the performing of surgeries on the genitals of intersex people. It was his theory that 
any of us could have been successfully assigned either a male or female and raised successfully in, the, in that sex. Um, but when you're born with ambiguous genitalia, like I was, surgery is needed to cement that decision. And this would guarantee family acceptance and, and so on and so forth, but I'm not finding that. Um, oftentimes the, the division within the family that the surgery is actually the catalyst for that separation uh, with the child being treated differently, um, being treated differently by siblings. The, part of his protocol was that our medical priorities for those that don't know, because I know everybody in the panel knows that our medical histories be hidden from us. We, we, we're just to be raised as a, as a quote unquote normal binary child and we are not to know. And this creates a whole host of, of, of problems that I'll get into um, a little bit further on. Um, but part of that is the secrecy within the family. And this comes up over and over again in the interviews that, um, that I've, uh, I've done with participants from across Europe. Uh, so, because nobody can mention it, uh, siblings are seeing their intersex sibling being taken off for, uh, for vacations and trips, and they're seeing this as favoritism. Uh, the families are treating the child differently. There, there's uh, a lot of stigma and shame with the parents, uh, a lot of guilt. And this seems to, um, from my interviews, this is lifelong lasting. This isn't something that people get over. This is a, a, a split at the very beginning of life that's very, that's unnecessary. That this split can be addressed through addressing the stigma and the lack of awareness, but this is a manufactured split through surgery and secrecy and a lack of awareness that lasts for the entire lives of people separating them from the rest of their families. So this points to an urgent, urgent need <clears throat> for awareness and education, for intersex people themselves, for the parents, uh, for the public, and also for medical professions, professionals, because I, time and time in my research, I'm finding that people are going to get help and medical professionals don't know, we're not covered. That secrecy, when, when they decided to hide our medical histories from us back in the 1950s, that also meant we were not presenting as intersex seven-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, so uh, intersex knowledge around our bodies and the development of, intersex, of knowledge in, in med, uh, med school curriculums and all died along with that secrecy. <clears throat> so there, there's a lack of awareness. Um, I, I gave a talk not that long ago to a, the biggest conference of uh, sexual and reproductive health professionals uh, in the UK. Many of them had never heard the word intersex. And, uh, Many of them had no idea that these surgeries are still continuing on an industrial level worldwide for the most part. Um, so speaking of the, the, the division, uh, the child is experiencing time away from school. They're, they're not having that bonding with other uh, students. Uh, they're, uh, they're, um, let me see, secrecy around, uh, intersex people ask questions around their own bodies. Sometimes they were punished for asking those questions. Um, and also it comes up quite a bit, a feeling of being, of, of being, of having something wrong with you, being faulty. So when, when, when um, especially when you can't get answers to any of these questions, and this comes up in almost all of my interviews, uh, the secrecy combined with the stigma and the shame so you've got people going through their entire lives feeling that there's something wrong with them. And that has knock-on effects throughout their entire lives. And it isn't just the kids who, uh, intersex kids who undergo surgery. It's also people with Klinefelter syndrome because you've got kids going into school who it, it's, uh, I think the figures from uh, the Klinefelter Association in the UK are that uh, one in every 600 children assigned male at birth have Klinefelters. That's quite a lot. And with the lack of awareness, the lack of testing, uh, you've got kids going to school and all of a sudden they're developing breasts and, and their bodies change in, in unexpected ways because there's no knowledge around it. And that's including the, the, the child with Klinefelters too. So you've got children getting bullied out of school um, for having a different body. Uh, so it, there's an urgent need for inclusion of intersex 
awareness and, and bodily diversity in curriculums in school. Again, not just in, in school for, for children as, a, as is age appropriate, but also for, for uh, medical students. It, we just need greater awareness amongst the general public and it shouldn't just be up to intersex people to do that work. Um, again, a lot of school bullying. I've, I've talked to a lot of people who've uh, been bullied out of school pretty early on, which had a knock-on effect for the entire rest of their lives. Uh, lifelong exclusion, othering. Uh, you hear a lot in the news these days about um, intersex in sports with Carmen Semenya, and then of course the, there's the whole trans battle and what is a woman and all this stuff. Because of the lack of awareness, uh, sports and areas like that can be an absolute nightmare for intersex people. Um, locker rooms are a nightmare. You've got people dropping out of beloved sports uh, pretty early um, in life uh, and losing opportunities to continue to bond with other people and get all of the. I mean, we push sports as important for a reason and intersex kids are missing out on those because of a lack of awareness. Their bodies are changing. In, in ways that they did not expect and trips to the hospital and all of this stuff. And it isn't really necessary. That can all be fixed with just awareness and education. Um, you've got kids missing out on sleepovers with friends, camping trips, and they're missing out on those opportunities to forge what could be lifelong relationships that, that are gonna manifest in social areas and work areas and so on and so forth. Um, othering in childhood, tends to carry on it doesn't just stop you leave school and then you just fit in and, and you know you, you just flourish in the rest of your life uh, uh, many of the people i spoke to experience workplace bullying some people were bur bullied out of a job um, social settings can be very very uncomfortable um, i've talked to people who have avoided romantic relationships for their entire lives for fear of humiliation fear of rejection um, also, some for the pain and discomfort that comes with living with uh, what is done to us as children. So this leads to an awful lot of isolation. Um, many of the people I talked to described finding other intersex people as absolutely life-saving. So intersex community has been, has been massive. It comes up time and time again just finding somebody else who relates to you. And it's, it's also really interesting that intersex people, there's more than 40 different intersex variations and all of us can find ways to connect really easily. And there's so many questions you don't need to have or conversations you don't need to have with other intersex people. We just, for the most part, come together like glue and, and it's, it's been described as, as absolutely vital by many of my participants. Uh, but there's barriers to intersex communities, such as people just not knowing that they're intersex. There's people getting their DNA test done and finding out later in life, or they have a, a medical test done. A lot of client filters people uh, find out through fertility testing, but with uh, the social bullying and, and things like that, and uh, low libido, there's a lot of uh, client filters people that are, are not getting um, that are not getting tested so they'll never know and there's a lot of intersex people struggling through life wondering what the problem is when it could easily be answered i talked to intersex people who turned to their doctor and said can you connect me with other intersex people and they were told no um another thing that comes up quite a bit there is a difference between um transgender people and intersex people they're two separate things but uh, there's a lot of intersex people who've been assigned the wrong gender at birth and then put through um, surgeries and hormonal uh, um, procedures that do not align with the sex that these people were, were, uh, were assigned um, at birth. Most of the participants I spoke to did not feel comfortable with the sex uh, that they were assigned at birth, some did. Um, and then some of the ones who were comfortable with the sex they were assigned at birth had struggles with uh, being asked the whole time why they had bodily characteristics generally associated with the opposite sex or having to wait in the, the women's section of the hospital and getting what they perceived as was funny looks. Then you've also got the people battling gender dysphoria or currently, as, as I'm sure everyone knows, being right in the crosshairs of the far right and the whole trans thing, a lot of us have been put there by the, the surgeons, the endocrinologists and neurologists we encountered um, right after we were born. So um, community uh, has been described as life-saving. Um, however, COVID and lockdown 
has really jeopardized that sense of community for some intersex people who are already experiencing compounded isolation. So solutions to these problems, awareness and education. Um, if doctors and nurses that we encounter, uh, and this came up throughout my research, just encountering medical professionals who had no idea what, they're, what you're talking about, but they still knew more than you um, because they're doctors, but they, our bodies are not covered in their curriculums and they don't know anything about us. Um, if, if, we, if they don't know anything about our bodies, how can we expect therapists to know anything about our bodies? Some people, some of my participants described finding a good therapist as life-saving, but often finding a good one can be an excellent possible or even affording a good one. Uh, we need to stop IgM. That would be a really, a really big one. I mean, in John Money's own PhD research, he found that we do just fine without the surgeries. And then his theories were then the catalyst for it being performed on so many of us. And it's caused untold harm. Um, meanwhile, um, if, if we could, if we could today stop uh, IgM, intersex genital mutilation, for those that don't know, we need to help everyone else that's uh, already being operated on. Um, time and time again, urologists and endocrinologists will pawn us off on either non-existent therapists or therapists that for the most part are, are ill-equipped to deal with our needs. Uh, over and over again, um, a co as a coping mechanism, um, almost every single person I spoke to, no, every single person I spoke to use the arts in some way to survive and to thrive and to express themselves whether that was music. Um, I, I know I wouldn't have survived my childhood without finding art. Um, I'm still a, a compulsive scribbler, as anyone who knows me will attest to. Um, but every single person I spoke to was, was, was writing a book or was a published novelist or, or a musician or, or were in theater or painted. Um, so I, I think it, it's, it's worth um, taking a look at what actually does work for us and uh, also developing the things that we really, really need that just currently don't exist and also just stopping the harms now rather than continuing them. So I, I think that's all I've got. Thank, oh, you, thank you so much, Evelyn. Thank you. I appreciate your intervention. And yeah, I, I, as you said, we have some strategies that can we can use as well. Mm -hmm. However, most of this harm that, uh, as you indicated, is, you know, the suffering of trauma or depression and suicide are a consequence of the violations of our bodily and physical integrity and mental, you know, and our right to self-determination. So we are experiencing with these consequences. And so it is important to understand uh, what are the root causes of the reasons why we, these surgeries are still happening around the world. But at the same time, you cannot forget that there are people that are experiencing these surgeries these days, and we have to look after uh, the needs of these people and fight for justice, fight for reparations, uh, which is another aspect that we do work as civil society. And you actually did a very good, important connection with the impact of COVID and how COVID has amplified the invisibility of intersex people and actually has deteriorated even further the situation of their of intersex people worldwide. Now I'm gonna have Haiker Chu, who is a pioneer of the intersex human rights movement in the Asian region. Haiker is from Taiwan and Haiker founded OII Chinese, the first human rights advocacy organization and inform, information platform from for Chinese speaking intersex people. In 2008, um, Hiker was the first person to come out in Taiwan publicly, initiating the global free hug with intersex movement. In 2013, Hiker has, uh, has been devoted to building Intersex Asia Community Online, which was the base for the first and the only regional network of intersex organizations in Asia, which is called Intersex Asia. Um, currently, Hiker observes at both the is both the chair and executive director of Intersex Asia, and Hiker is going to present to us the report that they wrote, which is Indivisibility Amplified: A Report on the Impact of COVID nineteen COVID nineteen on the Intersex Community in Asia, which is a survey uh, first of its kind and scale which aims to measure or aim to measure the impact of COVID for intersex people in Asia. 
And I just pass it on to you, my dear hiker. Hello, uh, dear all uh, participants. Uh, we yeah, are very happy to have the opportunity uh, to be here to share uh, the information with you. Um, yeah, in, actually, Intersex Asia is a very new uh, network. Uh, so, uh, but and so you know, for us, we are still exploring the you know a, any uh, intersex issue here in Asia because this is the purpose. That's why we build the network because in Asia we don't have many intersex activists and organization here so we want to find out you know what are the specific intersex issues here uh, in Asia so uh, this is our main job and for so and also like uh, research about intersex are not only you know uh, in the world. I think in Asia is very, very rare as well. We are just starting this work and this survey actually is our first try. Yeah, so the survey actually is focusing, um, uh, not, not focusing on the mental health, but the front the survey, we see, okay, the, the impact on mental health actually is huge. And uh, I also want to emphasize that, that not only intersex people, uh, uh, face the uh, mental health impact, you know, also the intersex activists, you know, face a huge amount of, you know, mental health uh, pressure because they are, they are the one, you know, who, who uh, taking care of, who's taking care of the, of the whole intersex community in the country. And also, uh, also the parents of intersex, uh, uh, child also face a uh, very high, you know, mental, very high pressure on the, on the mental health issue as well. So this is something that uh, in uh, my observation, I want to highlight. Yeah, um, okay, so this uh, survey is, uh, is that was done in 2020, following the call of the uh, international intersex community, uh, especially OI initiate, OI in Europe initiated. So uh, we conducted uh, our first survey to understand the impact to intersex people uh, during the pandemic. And this it is a, a, a survey with for only 45 intersex person from nine country in Asia. So you can see that we are still in the quite you know beginning. Uh, and the survey covers you know 10 areas, including physical health, mental health, education, finance, employment, housing, travel, um, personal safety, uh, human rights, and uh, intersex activism. Yeah, and overall, uh, the top you know, four impacts are finance. Uh, you can see that this is, no, this is common and normal during the pandemic, uh, and it is very high, 65% that we uh, face impacts from finance. And, is the, the second one, the second highest one is mental health. It's even higher than the physical health. Physical health, we only got uh, 28%. So the mental health is much higher. And, and other, we have employment, uh, 43% and education, 37%. But I, am to, I want to emphasize that uh, all the, uh, the area uh, other than mental health actually uh, also impact the mental health. Uh, of intersex people. And uh, during the lockdown, people, uh, because in Asia, so many intersex people, they, uh, they earn early wages. Uh, so they lost their income suddenly. Uh, and many people face uh, survival issue. Yeah, and 30% uh, of participants who also face you know, um, serious income reduction. So these are financial part. And actually, it increased the risk, the risk, you know, uh, mentally, right? And also, some of, and then some participants also report that they face domestic uh, discrimination and the violence. Uh, they were even kicked out by their family due to uh, the financial issue and the discrimination issue. And so 65% of participants said that COVID-19 had a severe impact uh, yeah, to, their, uh, to their financial situation. Yeah. 
e financial crisis actually impacts mental health improvement in education. And uh, during the pandemic, social discrimination impact both healthcare, health access and the mental health issue further. 15% uh, of participants respond that they were unable to seek treatment for COVID-19 infection due to fearing the discriminatory behavior of doctors and which could trigger their uh, past trauma. I think this is very specific for intersex people. And 66% of respondents uh, report that they were unable to access the medical uh, institution that are equipped uh, to address the specific need of intersex people. Uh, in Asia, hardly any medical or mental health professional is equipped with proper knowledge about intersex condition. Not even mentioning intersex mental health issue and intersex human rights issue. So more than 66% of uh, respondents uh, experience worsening of their mental health uh, during the pandemic. This is very high. And actually in Asia, human rights uh, for intersex people actually is a new issue uh, uh, for everybody, uh, including intersex people. So you can see uh, from the result that the human rights impact is marked only 9%. Uh, so this is the least impact during the COVID-19. But I, I think it means that you know, most intersex people uh, in Asia don't quite realize uh, what human rights are. Uh, uh, are and the, what rights uh, they have and what human rights they have been violated. And this is something uh, uh, specific, I think, in, in Asia. Um, and social uh, discrimination that caused um, many um, basic issues, including mental health, uh, are certainly human rights for everyone. Yeah, we, I, we, I really want to highlight that this is a human, uh, mental health is uh, you know, human rights as well. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we, we, because seeing this you know, situation, uh, Intersex Asia launched twice a COVID-19 urgent fund to support intersex community in Asia. This is the first time in this history <laughs> in Asia. And uh, because uh, we, intersex people were, is, is always invisible, right? Even now, still, you know, very common, invisible, in, you know, by the society and by the government. So we, and the, due to the traditional discrimination, bias, stigmatization, you know, intersex people, it's very hard for intersex people to get, you know, um, access to, uh, so you know, uh, social service fully. So, the, so. So we are very proud that Intersex Asia is the first uh, work organization to support intersex people on the ground directly uh, in the history. And we distributed uh, to uh, 95 uh, intersex people uh, uh, the urgent fund to support them uh, to resolve the you know, financial uh, issue. But I think uh, Financial issue is only part of the uh, key uh, to reduce the mental health uh, condition. We in Asia, I think the, the social discrimination, stigmatization, and also the, those are superstitious to intersex people uh, to misunderstand that intersex people are something uh, cur you know, a, 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 you know, a kind of curse, you know, uh, by the past life, and, and it's not, uh, it's a unlucky, you know, for to people. This is something that a uh, very serious issue that we need to face because uh, in some country, uh, we don't even have, you know, doctors who are who are aware about this, you know, this issue and these people. So, uh, so from the from the very, you know. Uh, very uh, from the ground level, uh, yeah, the intersex people is like uh, uh, all kinds of support. So, and also after that, we 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 aware that um, because of discrimination and this, this all of this stigmatization issue that intersex people may face um, um, many um, 
uh, isolated issue from the from from very from very young, and so they could be prevented by you know uh, proper education, and this actually impact their in their uh, employment. Education is related with employment and financial rights, so, and and at and with the and with the uh, social discrimination, it is really a a great um, ple pleasure, you know, to uh, on, on intersex people in Asia, and also like the gender binary, uh, gender binary norm actually is also very high, uh, to to people in intersex uh, in, in in Asia, um, uh. This because this um so you know for for during the pandemic I think the social and the economic issue, uh, that causes the mental health issue, uh, other other roots that we need to uh, to face and address. But you know in the uh, in my past ten years uh, uh, experience in the uh, dialoguing dialogue with uh, my intersex friend in China. I have uh, more than 100 contacts from you know intersex people from China, and I have to tell you that uh, people who has uh, has has mental health is, is almost 95 percent. I get I have to say that because everyone uh, who contact me, the first uh, question they ask is that Have you ever think about to suicide, and some of them had tried to suicide so many times, and all of them uh, feel, you know, all their life are isolated. So even though they don't, they they don't need, they don't necessarily have to have surgery, but uh, this kind of you know social uh, stigma, social norm, actually, in Asia, actually gives a a, a lot. A, a huge pressure on our shoulder, you know, and impact our mental health. So, yeah. So I think we 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 really need to uh, uh, in, in in to address you know to the all those um, misunderstanding to intersex people. So we we can you know remove those uh, social discrimination from the society and you know uh, remove those uh, social. Uh, social norm, gender binary norm that you know impacts our daily life. Thank you so much, Hiker. And as you said, mental health is is a human right. Yeah, and we need a fundamental change. We have drivers of discrimination that are deeper than our understanding even of the problems. Uh, as uh, Adeline said, stopping IGM might not necessarily stop the mental health challenges that intersex people experience. But as we live in a world structure in capitalism and patriarchy rules and demands and controls the autonomy of women, the autonomy of people, the marginalized communities, we become more aware that intersex people fall always under the margins, under and beyond those margins of society. And we always, uh, in those, you know, cross sections of poverty and extreme poverty and abject poverty. Now, now that um, I have the opportunity to introduce my dear friend Irene, and I would like you to, uh, my dear friend Irene, sorry, just my screen got a little bit wobbly. Irene works, uh, Irene Kuzemko works as the capacity and a community building officer of OIA Europe. Irene is a 29-year-old from person from Ukraine and Russia who is currently living in Berlin, Germany. Irene is a proud intersex person, activist, and filmmaker who has been active in the movement since 2015. Irene is gonna have is gonna present us the report on the situation of intersex people in Europe and Central Asia uh, of this ongoing pandemic, and is gonna give us some updates of the future. Uh, uh, follow-up report that is going to come shortly. So I pass it on to you, my dear Irene. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Eli. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much for having me to Gate and Ilgo World. And it's such a pleasure for me to be here with people whom I have like so much admiration and love. So 
Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. I will talk today. Oh, thank you. I will talk today about the survey which we launched SOI Europe in Europe and Central Asia in 2020. It feels like it was just, you know, yesterday, but actually it's been a long time. Uh, the survey was launched within our movement and it was made available in seven languages, English, German, Greek, French, Polish, Russian, and Turkish. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, the survey was filled in uh, by 63 intersex people, including six minors and three family members of intersex people, all of whom were coming from 16 countries from Europe and Central Asia. So we had 31 respondents from Eastern Europe, the Balkans and Central Asia, 15 responders from Southeastern Europe and 17 respondents from Western Europe and Nord Nordic countries. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, like everyone, intersex people live their lives in the intersection of different aspects of their identity and lived realities. As the first months of the pandemic have shown, fundamental rights are easily breached in times of crisis, and harassment, discrimination, and other forms of violence increase in times of general struggle and angst. While being already very vulnerable, vulnerable as a result of being born with variations of sex characteristics, other factors can amplify the challenges. Out of intersex people that responded to the survey, more than a third stated that their gender identity and gender expression amplified their vulnerability and a quarter felt uh, that their economic status and their sexual orientation increased their vulnerability. Age, disability, and ethnic background and skin color were also stated as additional factors. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, when asked to mark areas of their lives where they felt an impact of COVID-19, a majority of all survey respondents chose the area of mental health and traveling plans. So mental health got 67% of the respondents, so two-thirds basically. It was the main impacted area of life. And traveling plans... Uh, this area is clearly strongly connected to intersex activism. Both areas rank first among respondents of all subregions. For the total of respondents of the survey, the financial situation and intersex activism, which is again uh, closely connected to travel plans, were the second most prominent areas. And they were followed by employment situation, health, education, personal safety and housing situation. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, easy and affordable access to general healthcare becomes even more important during a pandemic. Unfortunately, this access is not guaranteed for a substantial parts of survey respondents with 40 intersex respondents, 40% 40 of intersex respondents uh, saying that their doctor appointments were postponed and 22 of them saying that their appointments were canceled. Obviously, restrictions caused by the pandemic lead to an availability of medical personnel, do lockdowns, cancellations of appointments, and other things. Uh, and out of the respondents, 21% uh, reported they don't have an access to doctor who has the necessary experience with intersex body, and 14 have currently no access to the doctor that they trust. And obviously, the impact of uh, on intersex people is aggravated by the trauma and the challenges that they face in medical settings. Experiences of disbelief, harassment, and violence from healthcare professionals and the lack of knowledge amongst the general practitioners about the existence, let alone the specific needs of intersex people were widely reported as aggravating factors already before COVID-19. And so, as many reports to OI Europe in the past year show, seeking a doctor can be a really traumatizing experience for intersex people, and decision to take an appointment can be emotionally demanding and triggering to a person. 
And when such appointments are canceled or postponed, the ongoing stress of waiting for another appointment can again impact person's mental health. And plus, a cancellation may put intersex people who are in need of treatment, uh, including those uh, who are in need as a result of a medical intervention that they were subjected to, it puts those people at risk. Intersex people's problems are amplified during the COVID-19 pandemic because they have to relieve their previous trauma through the actual contact with medical doctors and hospitals. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Many intersex people uh, need to follow a medicine taking regime or take hormonal replacement therapy on a regular basis, which is often a result of gonadectomies and other non-vital procedures that they were subjected to in their lives. 40% uh, of intersex respondents to the survey uh, said that they follow an HRT or medicine regime taken on a regular basis. Out of them, 64 only take their medicine as regularly as they did before the pandemic. and But 24, so almost one third, report, reported that they had to stop or will eventually stop taking their medicine. And 10% of total intersex respondents were at risk of already stopping medicine in July 2020, which is like more than two years right now. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, in regards to access to healthcare related to a possible COVID infection, 51% of intersex responses had not had health issues related to COVID back then. But out of those 20% that had COVID symptoms, only 2% went to see a doctor. 11% stated that they didn't go see a doctor because doctor's appointments being too triggering due to their intersex related medical trauma. Some reported that they are afraid of getting COVID-19 as it will force them to enter a medical environment, but also because access to medical help is impaired by requirements which are not related by COVID infections. In some countries, intersex individuals with COVID face severe risks to their safety, uh, to the way medical care for COVID-19 patients is set up. As one participant uh, wrote, I'm quoting, I'm very afraid of getting COVID because of my medical intersex trauma and the fact that the doctor's appointments are too triggering for me. Uh, continuing my text, uh, not only is caused uh, examinations, which are completely unrelated to COVID-19 symptoms, which people are subjected to in some reason by local therapists. It's also a violation of individuals' physical integrity and autonomy, which again creates obstacles for individuals to access healthcare in times of pandemic. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, by the way, all of these infographics were created by our awareness raising and campaigns officer in Sacraminga, who is also an incredible artist. So yeah, this is why they look so good. I didn't make them. Uh, talking about intersex activism, personal face-to-face -face connection has been the key to emergence of intersex communities on national and regional levels. In early 2000s, while emerging online communication, and at the start of the intersex movement, you know, uh, online uh, platforms were important means for intersex people to reach out and connect when there was little possibility to meet in person. And that's what allowed, you know, the online connection allowed the movement to start growing rapidly and allowed intersex activists from all over the world to meet for the first time during the first International Intersex Forum in 2011. The same trend emerged for the European intersex movements uh, when, for example, OI Europe started our community events and public conferences, as well as pre-meetings at the ILGA Europe conferences. Uh, so with this background, travel restrictions and other restrictions induced by the pandemic have a multidimensional impact on intersex people in, and their families. In addition to the significant impact of their well-being, they negatively impact on intersex activism because people might need to cancel travel, postpone events or projects, or some of them moving into online format. And this new normal 
you know, with online participation requires specific tools and financial means, which are not equally available to everybody. As one participant wrote, it will be even harder because you have to have the time, the IT tools and the financial means to be able to campaign. We are all in burnout. It's almost impossible to find a room to meet. It takes us more time and energy to coordinate the campaign. You have to fill out endless forms for calls for projects for a ridiculous budget. If we receive structural subsites, it would save me energy devoted to applications for subsites. End quote. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Obviously, the pandemic is impacting on many people's economic situation and financial stability across the world. And intersex people and their families are no exception. In fact, as the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union, LGBTI survey number two showed, intersex people are among the most vulnerable groups in regards to their financial and work situation. Uh, in 2019, uh, study 51% of intersex respondents confirmed that their household total income makes end, um, uh, making ends meet difficult. And 29 of intersex respondents stated that they experience housing difficulties. And in our OI Europe survey, we can see the situation may have been aggravated due to the pandemic. 41% of all survey respondents stated that their financial situation has become worse during the pandemic uh, as a result of the pandemic. 21% uh, reported experiencing severe income reduction, almost half of which are struggling to survive. Also, many reported prices going up during the pandemic, including prices for bare necessities, as well as uh, more incidental expenses. So basically, this was the results of the survey that we did in 2020 at the very start of the pandemic. And now, two and a half years, even more two and a half years later, as Ellie mentioned, we did a follow-up survey. So once again, we wanted to see how the situation changed like two and a half years later, how people are coping, how people were impacted. And the follow-up survey report is not published yet. It's still being worked on, but I can already just give you a quick sneak peek and mention that so many people load their mental health currently and throughout the entire pandemic as quite low. Like the standard it uh, rate is like 4.5 or 5 out of 10. And when asked about how their mental health changed throughout the entire pandemic, majority of the survey participants stated an increase of isolation and a decline of their mental health and well-being as a result of it. Also, people uh, reported that their friends dying also impacted their mental health and well-being a lot. People reported health problems, partly sometimes as a result of, you know, home office, a lack of movement and those kind of things. Activism was heavily impacted. Some people mentioned completely stopping activism, while some uh, mentioned completely uh, finding completely new ways to uphold or at least raise a, at least a certain amount of awareness and continuing their advocacy and community buildings. Uh, people reported it being hard to find information on how certain vaccines impact people with specific radiations, specific intersex radiations. And people had different opinions about the online format because some people mentioned it being hard to access for everybody. Some people mentioned how tired they are of it, but also some people mentioned how they got used to it and actually would miss some kind of uh, those kind of online events. So this is the upcoming report and this was it for the 2020 report. Thank you so much uh, for listening. And yeah, if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you so much, Irene. We're looking for that new report and thank you so much for that presentation, that amazing graphics and uh, in our, thank you for sharing this and all this important data and information. Uh, one of the things that uh, it is important and that we also have to acknowledge is the impact that 
um, Intersex Advocacy has on us, intersex human rights defenders. We also experience, you know, not similarly, but we also get affected and affected for all the stories that we, you know, we, we, we hear and also the work we do and being constantly triggered, constantly challenged. So I, 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 I want to thank you for also highlighting that. It seems very important that we acknowledge uh, how that affects us and how it's how important is self-care and how important is that we all take care of ourselves, give ourselves a space, and also remind ourselves that we are as human as the people we are helping and we are as human as you know anyone else. We have to always keep that in mind. I appreciate all the information you provided. Now I'm gonna pass it on to Kate. So Catherine K. Docky, Dr. Catherine, I'm sorry, is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health and Humanities in the Penn State College of Medicine and is a staff psychiatrist at Penn State Health and Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute. Her clinical and academic work focuses on the mental health of patients who are LGBTQI+ or have variations of their characteristics, of their sex characteristics. Her clinical, scholarly, and advocacy work has been recognized with appointment to the Pennsylvania Governor's Commission on LGBTQ Affairs, the Working Group of National Institute of Health, Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office, and as a consensus committee member of two recent LGBTQI plus health publications by the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine. Today, Dr. Catherine is gonna talk us about the national study on the physical and mental health of intersex adults in the US, which is a first, and we are very excited to hear about that. Welcome to the floor, Catherine. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ellie. And I just want to echo what other folks have said, which is that it's just beyond an honor to be here with people whose work I've admired for a really long time. And um, and it's really, I think, exciting and um, also humbling to realize, yeah, <laughs> um, it's also really exciting and humbling to realize how how much overlap there is in the, the challenges that we're facing across a huge range of societies and locations across the world. Um, I just pasted into the chat a link to the paper that I'm going to discuss. Um, and I before I jump into talking about the study, um, I wanted to acknowledge a little bit more about my positionality. So I do, um, I'm primarily employed as a psychiatrist. So I provide mental health services in a medical context. Um, but I also am an intersex person, have been the recipient of mental health services throughout my own life, uh, and I'm also a survivor of a suicide attempt. So these are all things that very sort of significantly influence the way that I think and talk about this. Um, and I'll also say that I came to um, clinical care and research primarily through intersex support and advocacy communities. Um, so the community really raised me um, in that way. So th this report that I'm gonna share with you is was a, a survey that was published in the scientific literature uh, in 2020. And one of the reasons it was so important was because as Ellie said, this is really the first ever a national survey of intersex adults that's been published in the scientific literature. And, and part of the reason for that is because in the US, most of our literature really focuses on the mental health and physical health of children. There's sort of this attitude that um, if you, like you can cure intersex in childhood with surgery and medical care, and therefore you don't really need to pay attention to adults once they turn 18. Um, and that's very much reflected in the literature. And in the US, there's almost nothing available for intersex adults um, outside of community-based settings as far as uh, medical or psychosocial health care. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that most of the research that we have has really been focused on clinical settings. And again, this is the scientific literature is done in clinical settings and looking at a specific intersex variation. So like depression outcomes in assigned girls with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, for example. Um, one of the major exceptions to this is DSD Life, which is a, a European-based survey study that's looking at uh, a number of participants across countries in Europe and across intersex variations. But this is still 
a clinical sample primarily, um, the, the demographics of that population may not necessarily apply to other places, including the US. Um, and Europe in general has a better system of health insurance than most other places in the world too, which, which certainly influences health outcomes. So our aim in this study was to try to understand and explore the physical and mental health outcomes in the US really uniquely through a community-based partnership with advocates and healthcare professionals. Um, and I was, I think, the only person involved in the study who was both like a community member and a healthcare provider. And then we had folks from um, either of those perspectives. So we collaborated with Interact and Interconnect, which are both US-based support and advocacy organizations. Um, and folks from Interact and Interconnect participated in the design of the study, our recruitment of participants, how we interpreted the data, and actually how we actually wrote up the paper. So this followed a community-based participatory research model. Um, the population we were targeting were folks over the age of 18, and we primarily recruited online through support and advocacy communities and also in person at the Interconnect meeting, which is a US-based support group meeting. Um, we asked a number of questions about people's demographics, their intersex-related health diagnoses and histories of surgery, including non-consensual surgery, and their physical and mental health. Specifically for mental health, we asked about previous diagnoses of PTSD, depression, and anxiety, and we administered some very brief screeners for depression symptoms, PTSD symptoms, and suicidality. Um, and in addition to to running statistics just to describe the sample. We also um, had a couple statistical tests that we used to um, evaluate whether the outcomes were varying by age and also to see whether there were demographic or health status influences on um, different outcomes. So altogether, we ended up having 198 people complete our survey. The mean age of our participants was about 37 years old, but we had a range from 18 to 78 years old. 73% uh, of our respondents were white, 14% were two or more races, and 14% were Latino or his Hispanic. Um, so overall, it was, a, it was a more white sample than you tend to see in the US, which is a limitation of the study. Um, also, interestingly, 66% of our respondents were assigned female at birth, and only 30% were assigned male at birth. Um, and I'm not actually sure how much that represents what practices have been in the U.S. are like. About 40% of our respondents had some form of androgen and sensitivity syndrome. Um, about 30% reported some specific variation in the length or shape of their clitoris or penis. Uh, we had 13% of people reported having ovotestes and 12% reported hypospadias. But what was really interesting, we had over 30 intersex variations reported in the sample. About 10% of our respondents actually didn't even know what variation they had, which for those of us in the community, like we know that the number is actually probably higher than that. Um, when, when you look at community samples overall, the number of people who just have no idea. Although we didn't report it in this paper, um, I can tell you because we're working on a second paper now, about 40% of our sample reported having non-consensual surgery at some point in their life, um, the vast majority of which was done before age four. When we looked at sexual orientation and gender identity, one of the other things that was really interesting that we weren't actually expecting to see was that 66.3% of people said their gender identity, one of their gender identities was intersex. Um, this is something that I think researchers have not really recognized that a lot of us will not just describe our sex as intersex, but also our gender identity as intersex. Um, and then uh, women was the woman was the next most common gender identity followed by non-binary. And we had a pretty even distribution of sexual identities across heterosexual, queer, bi, asexual, and lesbian. Um, one of the other interesting things about our demographics, so 40% of our, of our sample was earning less than $30,000 a year, um, which is considered low income in the United States. Um, and 60, uh, however, 60% of our sample had at least a four-year college degree. So it was really interesting to see that um, people were not earning what we might have expected them to on the basis of education level, which I think speaks to some of what um, Irene and Hiker and Addie have been talking about with problems in being able to access and keep employment um, and continue to earn commensurate with your education. 
So looking more specifically at the mental health outcomes, so the kind of the top line statistic was that 54% of our sample reported that their mental health overall was fair or poor. We saw that mental health in general was worse among younger adults relative to older adults, um, which we thought was probably overall consistent with national trends in the US that um, younger adults seem to be having more trouble with mental health than older adults. 60% um, of people reported a previous depression disorder diagnosis or, an, and sorry, excuse me, another 60% endorsed current depressive symptoms. Um, and this is more than three times the national average in the US based on um, survey data. 63% reported a previous anxiety disorder and 41% reported uh, a history of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we didn't have good comparison data um, for those numbers. Um, as Addie mentioned right at the beginning of Addie's talk, about a third of people reported a previous suicide attempt. Um, this is compared to 4.6% in the United States. Um, in DSD life, interestingly, the suicide attempt rate was only six was was only 6.8%, um, which is still significantly higher than their comparison sample, which is 1.8%. Um, and an Australian sample found a suicide rate of uh, suicide attempt rate of 19%. So what we're seeing really internationally are much, much higher rates of suicide attempt um, relative to the general population. Um, we also found that when you look at uh, some of the risk factors for depression and anxiety, at least in this analysis that we did, um, being worried about money uh, was a predictor of lifetime depression. Um, having a younger age was a predictor of lifetime anxiety. Having worse mental health overall was also an important predictor of, of experiencing disability as well. However, I think one of, the, one of the limitations was that in this study, we didn't examine associations with shame, stigma, discrimination, or experiences with healthcare. And these are really important, partly because you just heard from Hiker, Addie, and Irene that like, shame and stigma and discrimination and problematic experiences with healthcare are huge influences on people's mental health. And after we published the survey, there were a number of, of US surveys of uh, LGBTQ populations that found that relative to LGBTQ populations who were endosex, intersex LGBTQ people reported much higher rates of discrimination, housing instability, healthcare avoidance and mistrust and poverty. Um, because of that finding, we're actually working on two secondary analyses of the same data right now that are both looking specifically at experiences of non-consensual surgery um, as an influence on number one, healthcare mistrust and healthcare avoidance, and also non-consensual surgery, non-consensual surgery on mental health outcomes. Um, and probably unsurprisingly, we're, we're finding, at least preliminarily, that if a person has experienced non-consensual surgery, they are more likely to mistrust the health system and to avoid healthcare. And they are more likely to have depression and anxiety and PTSD symptoms than intersex people who have not experienced non-consensual surgery. So I think one of the, one of the things that we're taking away from this is, is recognizing that like the, the picture here is really complicated, right? Like we really need to understand the impact of specific healthcare experiences like non-consensual surgery on mental health, but also like non-consensual surgery is just like one piece of our mental health overall, that there's a much bigger component there, or maybe not much bigger, but there's a significant component there of stigma and discrimination, but also resilience outside of our medical experiences that we need to understand um, when we're talking about intersex mental health overall. Thank you so much, Katie, for that awesome presentation and for your research. Data, data, we need data, more data. And as we can see, all of you four and more people like you are doing an important work in collecting disaggregated data that allow us to understand what's going on with the lives of intersex people. Um, Ad Adeline was just mentioning like you cannot really an make an assessment on those that are not here because unfortunately have taken their own lives. You're mentioning how still, despite of some differences with other statistics like in uh, Australia, 
or even another st statistics that we have from Mexico, uh, by the CONAPRED in Mexico, uh, it's significantly higher the Swiss suicidality uh, on intersex people among other populations. And I think that um, one of the most important areas that we have to focus is mental health. But mental health is relational. Mental health is developmental. Mental health is associated with resources. Mental health is associated with our physical health. Mental health is related with emotional, how we interact with our families. It, it, it relates to the, the, how we access to opportunities, how we access to help, how we treat it at work, uh, access to our spiritual needs, our environment. So mental health is complex. Mental health is co-founded by many other factors. And I think it is very important that we acknowledge that in order to change the drivers of poor health outcomes on intersex people, we have to battle in different fields. You know, not just, I mean, the basic will be allowing intersex people to have support, allowing intersex people to have peer support, such as like what we've been doing here. A lot, some of us are associated with organizations working directly with intersex people and peer support saves lives. Peer support saves us. Peer support help us to feel that we are not alone because we are not alone. And we will fight together the notions that are harming our bodies and the notions that are harming our souls. We all have mental injuries and we all hope we can heal together. Healing together is magical. And I think that we are here today and I'm actually gonna start answering, uh, so, sorry, asking some of the questions that I got uh, from the people in the chat. So the first question I have is for you, Irene, and I'm, I hope this question is not sensitive because I understand that right now we are experiencing a war, but can you tell us what is the impact of the war in Ukraine on the mental health and lives of intersex people, adding to the fact that we are still in an ongoing pandemic? So yeah. I hope, I hope that's okay for you, maybe. Yes, thank you, Ellie, and thank you for this question. I will try to answer it. And it is a very difficult topic because I myself am from Ukraine and also from Russia, and I am in contact with intersex people in Ukraine or from Ukraine who have left Ukraine. And obviously with the new bombings today, it has been very difficult but impact is huge obviously on everybody's lives and you know apart from all the horrors of the war and like lack of safety and things uh people might not be able to escape the country for example because right now in ukraine if your passport your documents say that you have a male gender marker and if you are between ages of 18 and 60 even if you are a woman you're still unable to leave the country. Obviously, there are problems with lack of uh, hormones or medicine that is required. And same is actually experienced by our intersex community in Russia as well, uh, because you know of the sanctions and so many companies leaving Russia, uh, you know, people just cannot get the hormones that they need. And yeah, obviously in uh refugee camps and when getting asylum obviously people might encounter you know any kind of intersex phobia any kind of prejudice you know they might not right away get uh the necessary like medical insurance in the new country and might not right away or not at all get the access to necessary hormones or if they need any medicine or might not find a friendly human rights based intersex uh, specialist so yeah it's a lot and the issues that people might have already had are increase because of the war and on top of all the horrors of the war people also had all the issues that they might experience because they are intersex or because they might be also be perceived as lgbt or queer or any other letter 
So yeah, the impact is huge and, you know, we got to support and support Ukraine. And like for my, for example, personal health, what has been huge is as OI Europe being in touch with interesting people from Ukraine who we know and supporting them with everything that we can. And also like for my mental health, the best thing would be is defeating Putin and Ukraine winning and being peaceful and people living happily in peaceful, beautiful Ukraine. Thank you. Sending you hugs and, and yeah, I cannot, you know, I'm moderating uh, this session, but it also touches my heart. I also have family there. And I also, I only hope for the best. But as I said, we have to really be mindful that there are things we can control. There are things we cannot control. We cannot control the situation in Ukraine. What we can control is our attention to help intersex people in Russia and intersex people in Ukraine, particularly in Ukraine and uh, in those areas that are being occupied by Russia. Um, let's let's hope for the best. Let's hope that uh, that this conflict ends. But we we just want to let the world know that we are in this together. Even though if that's happening in in the eastern part of Europe. Uh, we have to act together. We also have to be mindful that that's not, not the only conflict around the world. There are other conflicts that are also impacting the lives of intersex people. I guess that's the conflict that we have on the news channels today, but the other pe intersex people that live in refugee camps, intersex people that are living in countries with, you know, in Yemen and Afghanistan. So we also have to be, uh, be, be asymmetric and mindful of that. Now, this other question that I, uh, I want to ask, I, this one is for you, Adeline. Can you uh, tell me what are the examples of efforts being made to help intersex people uh, in relation to their mental health? Yeah, um, some of the people that I spoke to expressed not just the fear of being dependent on care or going into care homes. Um, they they described it as a horror at the thought of uh, like one participant described it as they just picture the healthcare provider. And this person had been treated really appallingly by healthcare providers recently too. And in their, their care stood in stark contrast with how they were treated when it came to non-intersex related stuff. So when the healthcare provider didn't know that they were intersex, they were treated really, really well and they couldn't stop praising them. But when it, um, but they, they just described this fear of um, the carer uh, pointing at, the, at what surgeons had done to them and cackling and laughing. And uh, another participant talked about um, they said they'll probably kill themselves before they get to that point because they're just trying to avoid it. Um, in Switzerland, there is training going on with wonderful uh, intersex activists there where they're training care home providers and also certifying homes uh, that are taking on older intersex people, for example. Um, like I said, my research mostly looks at older intersex people's needs and experiences across Europe. So. This is kind of uh, older intersex person specific, but uh, mm. they're also in right now in Switzerland building care homes specifically for LGBTI plus people. So I would hope that those people would have more training than you might otherwise expect. So for example, in Ireland, if you're going to go in a retirement home, it's quite possibly going to be very closely related with the church. And that's the same in other places too. And a lot of us would not find that to be an ideal situation. Um, us intersex people. So uh, I think, I don't know, following Switzerland's example, um, maybe it isn't perfect, but it's, 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 a, it's a really big step in the right way, I would think. Thank you so much, Adeline. Actually, I'm mindful of the time. It's, we've been, we, we went a little bit um, ahead, um, further than the time we had. So, and I'm, and I'm aware that we, we have to complete the sentence. Um, I have another question. I, don't, I think I'm gonna keep it for the end if, uh, if we just first do this exercise. In this exercise, I want all of you, and I want to start with Katie, uh, if you can please say, um, the mental health of intersex people needs. And I just want each of you to say it. And I would begin with Kathy and you just can give the sentence and then, yeah, you can you can say bye. And yeah, thank you so much for all of you being here. It's a, it's a treasure to have 
the experience that you have, the reports, the studies, the information, the lived experiences. I'm very thankful to actually be able to do and carry on this moderation uh, with uh, on behalf of ILGA and with the support of GATE. I appreciate your time and I appreciate all your lovely intersexy energy. So now I'm gonna pass it on to you, Kathy. Uh, you can give your sentence and then you can say, you know, bye or whatever you have to say. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. And I, intersexy energy is like the perfect way for me to start a Monday morning here in the US. Um, so I would say that the mental health of intersex people needs to start with an awareness that our mental health is determined by a lot more than just our genitals and also action that promotes our resilience and our access to resources. Thank you so much for having me today. It's been a total honor and pleasure to be with you. Now I'm just gonna give it to you, Adeline. Um, I would say uh, intersex mental health needs an end to intersex genital mutilation, education and awareness. Thank you so much, my dear, my dear Adeline. Don't, don't forget to say your bye. <laughs> oh, bye all, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for including me with this absolute list of legends. Thank you. Now, I just give it, uh, give it to my dear colleague, Irene. Thank you so much, Ellie. Whew. Mental health of intersex people needs friendly human rights based mental health professionals professionals that will support you and will understand and support your fight for intersex human rights and the recognition of intersex human rights all around the world and also we intersex mental health needs more support of each other in our movement because we are so small and we need to uplift and empower each other Thank you so much for yes. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for being here. It, I had an absolute blast with everyone here. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you so much, and bye. Thank you so much, my dear. And now I just pass it on to you, Hiker. Okay. Um, Intersex uh, mental health and needs. Um, all your love. We need your love. <laughs> we need your, you know, your lovers, you know, with, you know, understanding your acceptance and uh, a warm big hugs. We always need that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for letting me join this uh, uh, activity. It's a very pleasure being with all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to everyone from Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. I want to thank you all for being here and for this amazing opportunity of sharing your knowledge and all the work you do, which is amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep researching, keep collecting data. Please share widespread. You know, it is time that intersex people in, are able to be empowered and to have control of our destinies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gay. Thank you, Ilga. Please don't forget to donate. Uh, if you want to access to our social media, you have uh, the information here that's shared. Uh, you have the Il Ilga's uh, medias and gates, and you can go in our websites if you want to donate. You know that our organizations are run with your kind donations, and I appreciate the time for today. And this video is going to be available in our media uh, for all of you to rewatch. Um, and thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your Monday, depending on the time zone you are. Thank you. <laughs>